uh, we're going to be starting with actually not 2 Timothy 3.16, this is going to be important, but primarily we're starting at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. If you guys have, <laughs> you guys have been with me for the last few times that I've taught in here, so you guys know that I always like to start at the beginning. <laughs> so wh what exactly are we going to be learning about today? One of the things that I was talking with Tom about is the encouraging things that we could use as men, the challenges that we need to have as men, and one of the things that we need to teach each other as men. And one of the things that came to my mind that the Holy Spirit dropped into mine is what does it mean to be a man of God? What does it truly mean to be a man of God, and what are the implications of that statement? And so one of the passages that came to mind is, of course, 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, where it says that all scripture is God-breathed, it's breathed out by God, and it is profitable for reproof, correction, for training and in righteousness, so that the man of God might be fully equipped fully ready to do every good work. But what does Paul mean by the phrase man of God? Well, this is, of course, not merely a time for lecture, but a conversation. What do you guys think that the term man of God means? When you have read it across in scripture, what have you surmised it to mean? Amen. I agree. Any other suggestions of what a man of God might be? Rex, Alan, what do you think? Well, that's, uh, you certainly think of a, a man of God as one who does live as closely as he possibly can to the things that God tells us he would like to see mm. in a man of God. Agreed. And so this is basically, you guys have already answered very well. And what we're going to do is we're going to dive a lot deeper into what the Holy Spirit has to say through his word about what a man of God is. What are those qualities? And where do we measure up? And where do we not? And what do we do when we don't measure up to what God has in his standards? So we'll look, um, as we'll look at um, Genesis chapter 2. Keep your eye at the beginning of verse 15 as I read this intro out for us. You see, the phrase man of God is mentioned and used about 35 times in the Bible, 35 times. Uh, Aaron Brown from Crosswalk says this. He says, quote, being a man of God is not something to be condemned, but rather encouraged. For any boy becoming a man or men trying to commit themselves more thoroughly to God, there is an answer to the question, end quote. A man seeking to know Jesus more and living like him more is a man of God. This man is not a perfect man, as we'll see, but he is a godly one. Dom, you spoke on this quite well. A man of God admits that he's not able to represent the Lord without the help of the Holy Spirit. And he will be strong through Christ and seek him each day. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to first see how man fails to be a man of God, how one fails to be a man of God, and then look at the qualities of the man of God, and then look at examples of a man of God. So we'll look and see the failure to be a man of God. Can somebody read for me? Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. 
The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. So here in this text, man is given at least two commands, two responsibilities. We've sort of reviewed over this a few times, so it might be fresh in your hearing. But what is the responsibilities that Adam has in verse 15? Two things that he needs to do. Alan, what do you think? So Adam has two responsibilities in verse 15. He has to do something to the garden and to do something else to the garden. Yes, he has to guard and to keep it. The Hebrew word used is shamar, which means to, to hedge around, to guard, to defend. So the man has a responsibility to not only take care of the garden and therefore take care of his family, but he is supposed to, to, to guard his family, to protect his family from any and all dangers that should come into his vicinity. But as we, yes, Alan? What's he going to guard against? That's a good question. <laughs> because the enemy whom he's supposed to guard against appears in chapter 3, verse 1. You see, in chapter 3, verse 1, we hear the first enemy in the Garden of Eden now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And then immediately after the introduction of the serpent, we have the actions of the serpent. The serpent goes to tempt Adam's bride. He goes and says to her, has God truly said such and such? Has God truly said that you should not eat of any tree in the garden?" So he, he brings about Satan's tactic. Satan's tactic first is to question God's word. Then after he makes you question God's word, he makes you contradict God's word. And then after he makes you contradict God's word, he makes you supplant God's word, putting your own will over God's own will. And so when the serpent comes into the garden and tries to tempt Eve, what should Adam have done? Any suggestions? When, when someone comes... Protected her. Right. And he does that by smashing the serpent, by killing the serpent, by getting rid of the spiritual evil that arises within the midst of the family. But instead of actually smashing the serpent, guarding the garden and his wife, and keeping it safe, what does he do? Eats an apple. Right? <laughs> Not only that, but he just stands by. While his wife gets tempted by Satan himself, she goes up, reaches the apple because she sees that it's good for food. She plucks it off and eats it. And then she hands it over, as the scripture says, to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Remember, we just saw the command that God gave specifically to Adam. God said, you have one job. Don't eat the fruit from this tree. He still had that command ringing in his ears, in, in my opinion, when Satan and Eve started to go straight to that tree, to pluck that tree from its leaves, and then put it in their mouths. So Adam knew for a fact God's commands, but still rebelled. And then what happens when they're discovered? What happens when they realize that they're naked? We all know this story. What happens? Look at verse, look at verse, uh, verse 7. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked. Then they are in the real world. Exactly. <laughs> they knew they were in trouble. <clears throat> and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. They realized that they were in shame. They didn't notice that when they were in God's will, but then when you step outside of God's will, what happens? You realize that you're not safe you realize that the hedge of protection that God was keeping is not around you anymore, and therefore you're vulnerable, and you're in trouble. And then in verse 8, 
And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The Hebrew is actually more, um, more explicit. It says, and they heard the sound of the word of the Lord. This same word, as we see in John chapter 1, verse 1, who is with God and was God. They heard the sound of Jesus walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Something that usually would be done every single day with Adam and Eve. And it would be a sign of comfort for them. But now, it's a sign of danger. And so what do they do? And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. What happens when a man shirks his responsibility to guard and protect his home. The house is put in danger. The man does not properly see his responsibility, and therefore he's vulnerable and he hides. Instead of facing his responsibility, instead of facing his own consequences, he runs. Not only that, as we see when God questions him, The first thing that God questions is, where are you? Adam, you are hiding your face from me. I already know where you are. You can't actually hide from me, but I know that you're trying. And that's a sign that something's wrong. Then, as Adam is questioned, he says, who told you that you were naked? Verse 11, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Rex, can you read verse 12 for me? Instead of taking responsibility, what does he do? Blame shifts. He blame shifts. He places the blame on his dame. Instead of actually taking responsibility for his consequences, he blames God and he blames his wife. How many times, how many men do you see in your own life when they make terrible decisions? Terrible decisions. They say, it's not my fault at all. I'm a victim. It's everybody else's fault but mine. How many times do we see that in this day and age? These are the men that we're raising. We are continually raising new atoms. This is what happens when a man fails to be a man of God. But this isn't just simply something that happens out there for us, out there in the the world of sin and death. It happens in the church as well. We men have a responsibility to take care of our women, not only physically, not only financially, but also spiritually. Brothers, consider this within your own hearts and within your own families. How many times has your woman come to you and said, you make me feel safe? How many times have your children come up to you and say, Dad, granddad, uncle, I'm so glad that you're here. I'm glad that I get to see you. You make me feel wanted. How many times have you asked your spouse or your children or your grandchildren, how's your spiritual life? Do you pray together with your family? Not just at the dinner table, but mornings and evenings. Do you read the Bible together? Do you know the spiritual well-being of your family? Are they going into heresy? Are they being properly taught? I can say for a fact, Don, I will commend you for this. Your family is absolutely amazing. And I thank God for the work that he's done in you because your wife is incredibly wise concerning the scriptures. And, of course, your daughters, too. Praise God for that. We men need to be careful of the spiritual well-being of our family because that's what God has placed us in. The first job that God has for us as men is not for us to go out into the workplace, even though that is good and necessary, but God has placed us as the head of households, not only the physical head, the authoritative head, but the spiritual head. And what happens when the man is not at home? What happens when the man is at home, but he's only physically present? 
when he's only a, a bump on a log and not actually caring for the, for the well needs of his family? What happens to the family? It crumbles, it breaks, and it dies. Alan and I have said this over and over and over again, and Tom has continually reiterated it. When the man is not at the head, everything else falls. The family is the core of society. And so if we want society to flourish, we need to start at the home. And if we need to start at the home, we need to start at the man. God forbid that we shirk our responsibilities like Adam did. But we realize that that's what we do every single day. Every single day. So now that we know the failure of what it means to be a man of God, we can start looking at the qualities of a man of God. So as you guys are considering this issue, what do you guys think are the qualities of a man of God? What do you think a man of God should be? What are, what are some of those attributes? Let me... Um, let me see if you guys can give me some names or, or attributes of what a man of God should be. Thoughts? Honest. Honesty. We see that Adam failed here. He failed to be honest. Very well done. Any others? Exactly. He is wise. Not merely of not merely of just simple head knowledge and facts. We have too many eggheads for that. I know that because I'm one of them. <laughs> but we need somebody who is wise in relation to spiritual knowledge. Can somebody turn to the book of Psalms? We'll, we'll read the first psalm, just the first few verses of Psalm chapter 1, because this is these are where Scripture tells us where wisdom truly comes from. Where wisdom truly comes from. Psalm what? Psalm chapter 1. Oh, yeah, verse 1. One through four. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of wicked? Amen. So it says that a wise man, someone who, uh, someone who is blessed, this, this term blessed doesn't just mean happy, but it means someone with good success, someone who is wise concerning morals, wise concerning virtue. And where does that source of virtue come from? It comes not from standing in the seat of the, scar, uh, the scornful or standing in the way of sinners, but it comes from meditating on the word of God, meditating on it day and night. True wisdom for a man of God is someone who properly studies his word, properly studies the word of God, and letting it transform him, letting it convict him, letting the word cut him, body and soul, bone and marrow, and letting it transform him into a person who loves his wife, who loves his children. Brothers, how often do you read God's word? Do you pick it up on a Sunday morning and then lay it down Sunday evening? Does the word of God come into your mind at around 8, 9 o'clock and then completely leave it after 12.30? Do you meditate on the word of God day and night? Do you teach it to your children? Is the word of God coming out of your lips like your favorite songs that, have, that you listen to every day? How is your reading life? Are men people of the book? Because that's what a man of God is supposed to be. 
You see, there are a few other qualities that we can look for in a man of God. Some things that we would expect and some things that we don't. One of them is that a man of God is gentle. He's gentle. This is not necessarily very countercultural today, but it used to be. Because sometimes we need more of that, what, what people would say, toxic masculinity going around. We, know, we need more people who are tough. We need more people who are willing to, to stand upon their morals, stand upon their convictions, and not care who gets in the way. However, that steadfastness, that toughness, does not take away a man's ability to be gentle. The same doctor who can use a hacksaw is also the one who is gentle enough to use a scalpel. Does that make sense? So here, for example, gentleness might not sound like an interesting trait to begin with for men, just as I was saying earlier, but it reminds me of the word gentleman. What is, the, what is the definition for, for you guys of a, of a proper gentleman? Thoughts? What, what is a gentleman to you? Shows respect. Yes. To so, men and women, not just to women. Exactly. Someone who is respectful, someone who is proper. We would imagine someone who's well-dressed, well-properly taken care of, someone who knows the right situation to use general shows of force. And even when he shows force, he is elegant in that expression. But he is also one who is gentle towards women, who is, who is respectful towards men, who knows his place and is respectful towards everyone. You see, in the book Gentle and Lowly, I highly suggest everyone get this book. It's pretty good. Dane C. Ortland, a uh, brother of Gavin Ortland, if I'm not mistaken, he describes that Jesus himself is described as gentle and lowly in heart. Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. Because Jesus himself says in that very same passage, one of my favorite passages because it gives us the comfortable words, Jesus himself acknowledges the sovereignty of God and salvation. He prays to the Father and says, Father, I thank you for you have hidden these things, hidden the cause of salvation from wise men, those who are wise in their own eyes, and have revealed them to babes. Yes, indeed, this is your sovereign will. No one knows the Father except the Son. And no one knows, no, no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and whomever the Son chooses to reveal him. Brothers and sisters, brothers, we're good Calvinists. We understand the sovereignty of God and salvation. We understand that God chooses to save whom he wants to save. But he also demonstrates the outward call for everyone to come to him. Because immediately after that, he gives us the comfortable words, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus is the perfect example of someone who's willing to flip tables when need be and cry for his best friend when his best friend dies. That is a gentle man. That's a gentleman. You see, when someone thinks of manly men by the world standards, we might imagine a physically tough guy who knows no weakness, who is constantly stoic or constantly getting angry and has no fear at all. But this is, an, this is not an accurate description of biblical manhood. It's not. Because biblical manhood and biblical gentleness is a character trait that reveals the interworking of God himself to men. Because... Men are made in the image of who? We're made in the image of God, right? Yes. So is God not gentle towards us? Does God not show compassion and mercy towards us? 
even when we don't deserve it, especially because we don't deserve it? And so how do we, who are called to image God, because the image is not just, it's not something physical, it's a responsibility that we have to represent God to the world. How can we, as men who are made in the image of God, not demonstrate the very compassion and the gentleness that God himself has served towards us? God forbid that we don't. A second attribute that we need to look at is courage. Courage. Everybody, we, we're, we're pretty much, we're, we're pretty much familiar with the, the intro to Joshua chapter 1, correct? Right. So, so Joshua chapter 1, here's the context. Moses is dead. <laughs> Moses has basically gone through his cycle. He's led Israel out of Egypt. He's led Israel uh, into the wilderness for 40, 40 years because Israel was disobedient. And God has given the rule that everyone over 25, uh, when they fail to enter Jericho, cannot enter into the promised land. That also included Moses. And so Moses is not allowed to go into the promised land, but he's only allowed to go up onto the Mount Zion and look. And so who in the world is going to replace Moses? Who is someone who has been with Moses that entire time, who knows how God works, who knows how God's behavior is, who knows God's law and is able to lead them? Here we get this middle-aged man, this, this old man, Joshua. And the Lord comes to him and he says, Moses, my servant is dead. You're up. Therefore, be strong and courageous. Meditate on my law. Neither go to the left or to the right of it. Again, I tell you, be strong and very courageous. Not because of your own strength. Not because of anything within you but because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let me ask you this question. What's courage? Does, does courage mean fearlessness? Like not having any fear at all? No. No, it means charging your head uh, even though you're terrified. Exactly. Whenever somebody says that they have no fear, I'm calling them a liar. I'm absolutely calling them a liar because it's false. Fear is something that is instilled within every man, woman, and child, and in many cases, it's a good thing. As you just said, Don, courage is not the absence of fear. It's the presence of fear and going through with the act anyway. We see this in the example of Jesus, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prays to his father saying, Father, if it be possible, if there is any chance, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to face the wrath of God. I don't want to take this cup of wrath. It is my natural inclination to want to avoid this. Jesus fears so much that his body starts sweating blood. If that's not fear, I don't know what is. But yet, Jesus says in that exact same phrase, yet not my will, but your will be done. And in that same act of courage, empowered by divine grace, the very Son of God achieves the greatest gift that is ever done. So what about you, man? Are you courageous when God tells you to go out and obey him? Are you courageous when God calls you into different aspects of your life? And you think, oh my goodness, this is going to ruin my reputation. This is going to ruin my, my safety. This is, this is going to possibly bring my family and children into danger. God is calling me out to be like Abraham, to go into an unknown land. Are we going to shrink back when God calls us to obey him? Or are we going to suck down our fear, come to our knees, 
and ask God for strength and for courage. Because Joshua was very afraid. He's going to be leading these people through wars and battles in order to take the promised land that God gave them. But God encouraged them, just as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. That's what a true man of God does. A true man of God is courageous because he realizes that God is with him. A courageous man leans upon the promises of God and trusts them to be his strength and his shield. He promises, he trusts in the promises of God in order to truly be a man of God. We don't have much time, so I'll move more quickly. Another one, as you just touched on, Rex, is honesty. A man who is truly honest, who, who t always tells the truth. Cole Douglas Claiborne from Crosswalk says this, quote, Men have been trained and socialized to avoid and ignore knowing their insecurities, which is one of the reasons they are less verbal than women about their insecurities. Vieira said, this results in being known, in less, in less being known and understood about them, end quote. A man of God is not beyond sharing his thoughts and feelings. He pushes past the macho man mentality and can step into vulnerability. How many times have you spoken to your wife, to your children, or to other men about how you're feeling? When somebody asks you, oh, how you're feeling, what's your, what's your general response? Fine. Fine, <laughs> good, I'm okay. Not, hey, yo, work is giving me a tough time. I'm so tired of these people. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. Would you please pray for me? I need your advice. I need your help. How many times have you heard men say that? How many times have we heard ourselves say that? How often do we see ourselves be vulnerable? How often do we let ourselves be vulnerable? You see, vulnerability is not a bad thing. Christ was vulnerable for his disciples, to his disciples. As we just said earlier, that same Jesus who flipped tables wept bitterly in front of his best friends over the death of his best friends. If you haven't heard it before, hear it today, it's okay, men, to cry. It is. It's okay to talk to other men about how you're feeling and let them encourage you, let them strengthen you. Because that's what God has given us a community for. This is what the church is for. It is to help you in your, in your walk of salvation. It is to lift you up when you fall. The church is called to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. You are part of a family. You are not on your own anymore. Heck, you never have been. God has been with you this entire time. We'll get to this a little bit more later, but do you get up in the morning hearing God say that he loves you? Do you get up in the morning knowing that I can talk to God about the problems that I have? And I know with confidence that he will hear me. Do I have to hide myself from God or can I be honest with him? We see David, the man of God, be honest with every single emotion that he has with God in the Psalms. Because these Psalms are addressed to God about David, taking all of his feelings, his joy, his rage, his sorrow. His repentance for his sin. Every single aspect of the human emotion is found in the Psalms because they express a man of God being vulnerable to God. How often do we read the Psalms? How often do we connect with the Psalms? Brothers and sisters, brothers, the, the, the Psalms should be within your lips every day. Every day. There are reading plans out there so that you can read the entirety of the Psalms in a month. You can. It's available. I've done it. It's called the Book of Common Prayer. But 
it's, it's, it's what can be done. It can be done. Meditate on the Psalms and let those words be your words. Because they are primarily Christ's words to his God and his word to us. Amen? Amen. The last one that I, that I want to touch on is that a man, and this will probably be the, the biggest one, one of the things that we've talked about this whole time, a man is responsible. A man knows his responsibilities and he keeps up with his responsibilities. A responsible man of God is a man who follows the Lord and takes responsibility. Well, you can trace this about all problems of society to one big problem. Weak and irresponsible men. Correct. Correct. In, in our, my field of practice is criminal law. Uh, and in a, my clients who are in That is the number one indicator. And in fact, um, if you break the United States down into, uh, into um, five racial groups, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, and, uh, and also Native American or American Indian and, and, and Native Alaskan, right. right? Those are the five groups. Which one of those groups has the lowest rate of incarceration among adult males? Which one? Asian. Which one of those has the lowest rate of out of wedlock births? Asian. Number, which is number two on the list. Which, is, which has the next lowest rate of incarceration for men as adults? Talent. White. What group has the second lowest rate out of wedlock births, white. Which group has the highest rate of incarceration? Blacks. Which group? Which group has the highest rate of out of wedlock births? Blacks. It is a direct correlation. It's the, a pandemic. The number one predictor of juvenile delinquency, dropping out of high school, drug and alcohol issues, and being incarcerated as adults is growing up in a single parent household. And that is, that is reflective of men who are irresponsible, mm -hmm. men who have not fulfilled their responsibilities as fathers. You're exactly right. And like, it, it's because we've shirked our responsibility, and I can, I can speak into the black community about this, that it's because we've shirked our responsibility as black men that we've made ourselves vulnerable. We've made ourselves, our children vulnerable, our wives vulnerable to the evils that come against this age. Just as Adam was not advocating his duty in the garden, so did Margaret Sanger uh, uh, come into the black community and give us the, the absolute Moloch sacrifice that is the evil of abortion. 
That's what destroyed the black community. And it destroyed the black community because men did not protect their women. We men have a responsibility to protect our families. And we know that because Christ took the responsibility upon himself for our sin. He didn't have to do that. He really didn't have to because it's our responsibility. But God took the responsibility upon himself for us. The wages of sin is death. And yet Christ took on our flesh. He became the second Adam and he took on our responsibility and our curse. Therefore, he gives us the ability to be responsible, to be men of God. And so as we look at every single one of these attributes of what a man of God is, we recognize one clear, glazing reality. We fall short. We don't measure up to this. So what do we do when we realize that we don't measure up to this? There's three things that we need to do. One, simple. We need to repent. We need to repent to let God know and ourselves know that we fall short, that we're not perfect, and that we incur God's judgment when we're not responsible. We need to confess our sins to God. And what's beautiful is that 1 John 2 says that if we confess our sins, Christ is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. When we fail, when you fail, go before your Lord and ask him to forgive you of your failures and strengthen you to fill you with his Holy Spirit so that you might succeed, to follow in his footsteps. Number two is also very simple. trust, to trust in Christ, to believe in him. Because if you repent, you recognize that you can't do this on your own. You can't. You need the saving and sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit to work within you. Because the only way that you can be like Christ is if you're united to him. And we are united to him by faith. And faith is a hearty full and sure trust in what God did for us and believing and trusting that God, what God did, he did for us. What he did, he did for you in order to make you a true man. God became true man in order to make us true men. And then finally, We need to realize. Realize what? We need to realize that God loves us. Because showing this responsibility, knowing this responsibility that we have to be a man of God, it can break us. It will break us on our own. As someone who is seeking to get married and seeking to raise a family, I already see the responsibility that comes to me as being the head of a household. I have a, well, I'm going to have a wife to take care of. I'm going to have to have a good job. I'm going to have to have all these responsibilities. On myself, I can't do it. I won't do it. But the thing that encourages me, the thing that strengthens me, and the thing that strengthens you is that you are not alone. God is the one who has gone before you. God is the one who is strengthening you. God is the one who is with you. He tells you every single day, you are my son. And you, I am well pleased. I know the responsibilities you're facing. I place them in your camp. But I did not leave you there for you to crumble. Be strong, man, and very courageous. Not because of your own strength. Not because of your own power. Not because of your own wisdom. 
Because to be honest with you, you're weak, helpless, and stupid without me. But the best thing is, is that you are not without me. You are never without me. You will fail. But I tell you what, there is nothing that you can do to make me stop loving you. Because there was never a time in which you and your actions made me start loving you. I've always loved you, man of God. And I always will. Let that fuel your love for your wife. Let that fuel your love for your children. Let that fuel your love for your grandchildren. Go out into the world and be men as Christ was for us. We are about to go into worship and celebrate the one who became man for us. Let his example fuel you to imitate him and show the love of the true man of God for you and for them. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for pulling back the curtain for us. <laughs> we know that we are generally keeping to ourselves. We're private men. But we know that you see right through us. You see through our vulnerability. And, and what's amazing is you don't hit us with a hammer. You caress our cheek and say, oh, son, it is going to be okay. God, we thank you. Continue to demonstrate to us what it means to be a man, what it means to be a man of God, and let that fuel us to look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. Help us do this. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You all are dismissed. <laughs>